Well, good evening, everyone. Um, Lieutenant Colonel John Randolph, Director of NISA Communications. And this evening we are going to cover communications for ground teams. We're going to be reviewing a significant number of basic uh, concepts uh, that you need to be aware of and just uh, an overall review of what needs to be done. Anyone who's had ICUT, you'll be familiar with some of this. It'll be a good review. And if you've not had ICUT, then uh, it will be a, a good heads up leading into that. Um, so what we'll be covering, starting with the next slide. <coughs> and uh, is the basic principles of civil air patrol communications. Now there's, there's six concepts or six things that CAP is concerned with in communications, and that's survivability. Reliability is next, uh, probably the two most important. Flexibility uh, is the ability to utilize several different types of communications, media uh, in, in the radio communications world. Uh, if one doesn't work or get where you want to go, you try something else. Maintainability, it's got to be easily maintainable uh, and, and that of course lends itself to reliability and speed and security are also important. So uh, security is where operational security comes in. Uh, we, we put that little bit of common sense in there, what we can, what we can talk about, what we can pass on the radio and what we shouldn't be. So uh, next. Um, <clears throat> safety is a big concern uh, at all times. We want to be safe in everything that we do. Uh, common things around a, a, a radio station set up, obviously the, the easy things, trip hazards, uh, make sure that you don't have things that are in a position where you're going to fall or something is going to fall on you. Uh, the <clears throat> the outside sources, lightning is a big uh, a big issue, especially when you got an antenna sitting way up in the air. Uh, you need to take precautions and make sure that it's always grounded. Wires and cables need to be out of traffic areas. Uh, again, we don't want to be tripping on them. Don't want to be stepping on connections, and you may pull a connection loose. So. We want to be aware of all of the safety concerns uh, and we want to locate the antenna away from electrical and away from people, away from people in particular uh, or have it you know, properly flagged and uh, identified as a radiation hazard because we don't want people getting around an antenna uh, especially when there's a lot of power on it. If it's an HF unit, uh, we don't want people getting into uh, the radiation pattern of the antenna. That's not healthy. Uh, so in properly grounding, again, we want to make sure that the path of lightning, uh, the least resistance to ground, we don't want it coming into the equipment or into the radios. Next. So we go to a summary of, of radio operation. Every radio, it doesn't matter whether it's a large base station, uh, an HF unit, one of the MICOMs, or if it's a VHF, doesn't matter if it's in a mobile unit, it doesn't matter if it's a handheld. You're gonna have common controls to every radio to get it to do as you want it. Uh, so you can have a volume control, obviously, so you can hear it. Uh, you will have a squelch control. It may not be a knob. It may be a program setting within where you can turn the squelch on and off. That will allow you to monitor a channel 
by turning the squelch, you hear all of the the background noise, but you'll also know if anyone is got a weak signal in there before you transmit. Your squelch control is important. Channel selector, obviously that is going to be a key item because you've got to be able to get on the right channel for your communications. And every radio is going to have a microphone and a push to talk switch. Again, the microphone may have the push to talk switch on it. In the case of a handheld, it's going to be on the side of the radio. So common controls. It doesn't matter which radio you pick up. That's going to have. You have a cell phone as a radio, believe it or not. And you have all of those controls on that, just like you do on a CAP radio. Radio setup. You have a radio trans now. The meaning of the both the transmitter and the receiver in the same unit. Uh, it is possible to have a separate transmitter and a separate receiver. You don't see that too often anymore today because technology is allowed uh, the combining of these units really over several decades now, but it would. Uh, the microchips and, and IC chips that we got now, you can really get them pretty small. So they'd be combined into one unit. So if you, the term transceiver means just exactly that, receiver and a transmitter all in one package. Base stations require a power supply. So you plug into the wall. Uh, 110 volt, that will turn the house current or the AC voltage into a 12 volt DC supply, which the radio requires. In the case of a mobile, obviously you, the mobile radio is going to be connected directly to uh, the battery of the vehicle. Antennas, there's many different types, vertical, horizontal, uh, dipoles, magnet mounts for vehicles, uh, Permanent mounts for vehicles, you see them on the roof. Uh, but every radio set has got to have these components. If you're missing one of them or one of them malfunctions, you're not going to be operating at all because you won't be able to get a signal out, you won't be able to communicate. So those are the those are the three basic key elements you have to have in order to get on the air. Next. Voice operating modes. There's two basic modes of operation uh, for voice, and we're talking now primarily in the VHF, uh, VHF side of communications, or so very high frequency. You have simplex. Simplex means that you have two radios on the same channel and they will be talking to each other one station at a time back and forth on that channel. It's, it's the simplest operation there is. A downside of simplex operation is that it is limited in its range. Uh, a base station uh, on the average with an antenna 25 to 30 feet up will probably we have a range of about 15 or so miles under normal circumstances. Um, so if there's a station further out and they're in a simplex mode, they're not going to be able to communicate with each other in that in that manner. That's overcome by using what we call a repeater. The repeater gets its name from its function in what it does. It actually operates on two frequencies or two channels. It receives on one channel and it transmits on another channel. So I have a unit that will transmit up to it and the repeater through its internal workings, which we're going to review in a moment, transmits to 
the receiving radio, but the repeater gives us the capability of doing this over a greater distance as we'll show in the next slide. Repeater operation. The repeater itself is going to be located at a greater height, a high point, a uh, perfect case in point. Uh, in Alabama, where I'm located, uh, there is a repeater that's located on uh, Chiha Mountain, and it has a height, an antenna height of approximately 2,700 feet above sea level. So that antenna can see, if you will, for that concept, out a significant difference as opposed to an antenna that's only up 30, 25 or 30 feet. So the transmitting radio will transmit to the repeater. And you'll notice on this slide, I'm mentioning or referencing a subaudible tone. This tone is what actually activates the repeater. Otherwise, it would respond to any signal that it received on that channel uh, from anywhere. It eliminates interference. The repeater increases the range of the mobile station or, or a handheld station because of its, its high profile location. And uh, all CAP repeaters will respond to specifically assigned subaudible tones. In other words, if you have a repeater located located, say, in Birmingham, Alabama, and you have another one located only about 40 miles away, uh, both of those repeaters could interfere with each other if you didn't ha have the subaudible tone to control what channel accesses which repeater. It eliminates a lot of, a lot of confusion in that manner. The next slide shows a little bit more about this. Inside that repeater, you have three sections. You have the receiver, you have a control section in the middle, and you have the transmitter section. So the repeater will only turn on its transmitter if it hears the subaudible tone could be one of two specific tones assigned to that repeater. One tone is a universal tone that's used nationwide on the national calling plan. That way, if you are in a different wing or have uh, a need to be elsewhere than your home wing, then you will be able to access those repeaters as long as you know which repeater channel to be on. The second tone is the repeater site specific uh, for that repeater, such as R26. And that will be a specifically assigned tone. So if you look at the diagram, you have a transmitter that is transmitting on a specific channel with a subaudible tone that you can't hear. The receiver of the repeater will pick it up, and the receiver receives the normally transmitted signal, but it will only turn on with that subaudible tone. That tone is what triggers in the control section the link for the push to talk switch for the transmitter, which your mic button is for the repeater, and the voice portion, which goes to the transmitter to transmit out on the repeater transmit channel and that would be the receive channel for the radio on the other end. To give you an idea of the advantages that the repeater gives us in VHF communications, going back to the example I gave of an antenna for a repeater located at about 2,700 feet, the repeater footprint or range, if you will, is a little over 100 miles. So that is a significant change in distance or the ability to communicate effectively 
as opposed to 10 or 15 miles in the simplex mode. So duplex is really important for us uh, in that respect. Um, next slide. Or actually, before we get into this, let me go back and see if there's any questions from anybody on repeaters or how those things are set up, any specific requirements, uh, see if we have any questions there. There are no questions at this time. There are no questions at this time. Okay. All right. Well, if you have any questions at any point, you know, feel free to send them in and we will definitely get them cleared up and get them answered. Um, Five habits of a good radio operator. Now, this is, gets down to where we all interface with this, and these habits apply to everybody, uh, from myself down to any radio operator, you know, basically in the nation uh, or any organization. Most importantly, you want to speak clearly. You want to make sure that you are understood, which means you need to enunciate your words, all right? Uh, you, you don't want people on the other end of, of your transmission. Remember, they can't see you. Uh, you don't want them to think that you've got uh, a mouthful of marbles while you're trying to talk to them. You've got a message to get across and speaking clearly in getting your words pronounced or enunciated clearly is very, very important. Probably even more importantly is to speak slowly. This may or may not make sense to some of you, but if you are writing down a message because it is a formal message and you're taking handwritten notes, writing the message down as it's being transmitted. If the person transmitting the message is speaking too fast, you will never be able to keep up with them. And so you won't get the whole message the first time. You may have to go back and get a repeat or whatever is necessary to get, to get the message done. So speak slowly. And you, if you ever get on the other end of and you're trying to copy something down where someone's talking too fast, you'll completely understand. The next thing is think. Please use your head. Common sense. As an operator, you're going to know what concern uh, the folks that you have been assigned to talk to or keep in communication with. Could be aircraft, could be teams, uh, it, it could be just within the mission base, or it could be within your group if you're working within the group. But you'll have an idea of what's going on, so you should really not be too surprised by things that would normally or commonly take place. So you get something that is a little bit unusual, Use your head and, and get it going in the right direction. Above all, remain calm, right? No matter what happens, no matter what you hear over the radio, how serious you may think, how serious it may really be, uh, never panic. I always tell people that When uh, I've been at NISA, it's been local activities in my squadron. Uh, it it really is true when it comes to communications and have a, a good radio operator. They understand patience is 99% boredom and 1% sheer panic. You never want to panic. Deal with the situation. Things get going real fast. Um, 
And when that happens, you have to stay calm and keep things flowing in order because the operator is the link. Could be the link between an aircraft that has a problem. Could be the link between a ground team and an aircraft. You could be relaying something, you never know. So always stay calm, use your head and don't lose it. Next slide, please. Uh, Colonel Randolph, there is a question. Oh, I believe Colonel Randolph, there is a question. Is, is the PL tone okay. the same as what you referenced here? Is the what now? Uh, there's a question about the PL tone. Okay. What about it? Uh, I believe it's from the previous slide. Right. Is the PL tone the same as what you referenced here? I believe it's yes. from this slide here. Yes. Yes. A lot of uh, the PL tone would be like, uh, I believe that actually is a is a Motorola term from way back and it's it's been carried over. It's a private line uh, is what Motorola built it as. Um, and it's the same thing. It is a subaudible tone uh, that uh, uh, is very low frequency. Uh, and there are there are a large number of sub, sub audible tones that can be programmed into a radio. Uh, but yes, that is correct. It is a PL. Anything else? Well, that's all. Okay. Uh, okay. For the alphabet, fun for everyone. Um, this is something that is utilized in spelling things in messages, uh, identifying specific letters in a group that you may be transmitting. Uh, the phonetic alphabet is standard throughout the military, Civil Air Patrol, uh, this is used especially when communications can get uh, uh, interfered with by background noise, static. Uh, also, if you have something in a message that has a unusual spell or maybe a difficult pronunciation, the phonetic alphabet is used to spell that word out, but you can't, uh, you can get that message across without any confusion. Uh, a lot of times the example is given is the word pizza. Well, a lot of times it, it is spelled phonetically uh, and it makes a big difference in how you do it. So any operator, uh, from the most proficient to the new person coming in doing eye cut. The phonetic alphabet you need to know and it can be learned very easily if you just start practicing spelling things to yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, to yourself uh, as you go along. You just pick something up like, oh, I don't know, could be anything. Uh, Something as simple as a book, Oscar, Oscar Kilo. So practice it. That's how you get proficient because you will use it uh, almost every time you get on the radio at one point or another. Next slide. Numbers. Numbers are the same way. They have their own unique pronunciation because a number can be confused very easily uh, in difficult communications circumstances. Uh, the pronunciation is one. Notice three is pronounced tree and four is pronounced fower or fower so that you get a di distinct difference in how it's pronounced and you can you can pick it out. 
five is fife because the V often is lost. If you just say five, it can be lost in, in, in background hash. Six and seven are the same. Eight, you want to be sure the pronunciation of eight, like you ate something. And niner, so that it doesn't get anything else. And zero is zero. That's the easy one. Uh, numbers, here it looks easy. Here it looks okay, fine. But as you get further down the road and you get moving into things and you have to send traffic with a letter number, as we'll see in a little while, then pronunciation can be very important. Next slide, please. Sending numbers, you're going to use programs, figures, decimal, time, and initials numbers. Okay, we have some examples here in how you send these numbers out. You don't do it digit by for 750. It would be figures, 750, all right? Niner, not nine. So in the next example, it would be figures 849er. When you have to put a decimal point in, the next example gives us what you what you have here. One fourteen point five becomes figures one four decimal five. You don't want to use point because that may not come through or it may come through as a word instead of meaning a decimal point. For time, remember everything we do is in Zulu time or Greenwich Mean Time, which we'll get to again shortly. But this one would be not saying figures. We're going to say time one six three five Zulu, making sure that we know or they know on the other end that what they're receiving is a time figure and then we end it with Zulu or Z so that they know that it is in Zulu without a doubt. They should know that anyway, but we always add that in there because it's possible that you may have to send a message that would have a time figure in it with a time zone figure in it, in which case you would be giving the zone designator instead of Zulu, which is for Greenwich Mean Time. Initials and figures, uh, E21 would be initial echo, figures to one. And then one figure in an initial, three dash alpha, figure three dash initial alpha. So you always make sure that there is a, a delineation in there with how you send these things so that they're very, very clear on the other end what you mean. We go on to the next slide. I think we'll see some more. Pro words. Oh yes, pro words. More things we use. These are a special set of words that we use uh, for brevity to help speed communications up. Uh, and also for clarity. Uh, the commonly used pro words, this is. Uh, everyone should know what, when you say this is, that means you. That is used as a, a preface to your call sign. You would say this is Goldenrod 4 or this is Cap 108. And it just it, it is you pick up the microphone if you're making a call this is and that's how you would go about it roger everyone knows what roger means it's the last transmission was received okay i understood it so roger would acknowledge 
a prior transmission. Over, I'm done. You go ahead. The guy on the other end who you sent this to, it's his turn to talk. Maybe he's got an answer for you. The word out means I'm all done. I'm hanging up the phone. Goodbye. Real simple. Wait, I'll be back in a few seconds. There is another pro word using wait. It would be wait out means that person wants you to wait on the other end or you want them to wait, but you're going to be back to them. It's going to be more than just a few seconds. It might be three, four minutes. But normally you will hear wait and then they'll have an answer for you or they'll be able to continue on. Say again in self-explanatory. That means you need the person on the other end to say again whatever they said because you didn't get it or maybe the other way around. Maybe they're asking you, say again, and they'll be specific. Say again, all before, all after, or whatever the case may be. But that's how you get a repeat. Correction, well, that's a correction. You got something incorrect in the last transmission and, or in the one you're in. And I really meant to say, Wilco is an acknowledgement of the transmission and that you're going to do whatever the transmission's instructions were, or you will comply. Affirmative is a simple yes. Very, very simple pro words. Uh, surprisingly, sometimes horribly misused, as we will see in the next slide. I think it's the next slide. Yep, do's and don'ts. Okay. Okay, you always want to end a transmission with either over or out, not both. Think about it. You know, if you say over and out, that means it's your turn to talk, but I'm leaving. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you also do not use Roger Wilco instead of Wilco. Roger Wilco means the last transmission was received OK and the last transmission was and I will comply. Don't get them mixed up. Wilco has a specific meaning. Roger has a specific meaning. So if you're acknowledging I got it and I'm going to do it, that's Wilco. If you're just acknowledging a transmission is Roger, don't put them together. And yes, I have heard them put together once in some very situations that you would not think you would hear that. But pro words add to the efficiency of communication. We don't ever use them in place of text in a message. So you will always, always use them as shortcuts, if you will, to getting the communications passed and getting that text, the text of that message passed, the pro words help the operators do it. Next slide, please. Urgency signals. We want to talk a little bit about this because these are extremely important. Um, there are three urgency signals, as you'll see on the slide. Mayday is an international distress signal. The short definition is whoever is transmitting that has a situation which is immediately endangering life, could be a life and death emergency, could be an immediate uh, property. Uh, I guess the most common thing we think about is uh, a ship at sea that is in the process of sinking, like say the Titanic did many, many years ago, they sent out a mayday to get assistance because they had a life and death emergency. There are specific uh, responses. If you hear something like this, uh, if you're in a position to 
lend assistance, you may want to answer. If not, you listen and help if you can. But Mayday is the most serious. It overrides all other communications on that channel. Uh, and it is something that needs to be responded to immediately uh, if possible. Again, uh, if you're in a position to assist or you're the only station that's hearing them, you may want to answer. Uh, PON is the next international emergency signal. And it is a serious emergency, not immediately life-threatening, but it could be if it's not mitigated, if steps aren't taken to alleviate it. Uh, the person or the entity that is transmitting this, again, most likely you're going to run into this uh, with a ship uh, at sea. If you're along a coastal area, you're more likely to hear this signal uh, although not hopefully very often. Uh, again, needs assistance. Uh, if you're in a position to assist, do so. If not, monitor and help if you can or request it. Security is a, extremely common uh, in major port areas along the coast uh, with uh, large uh, container ships and tanker ships. It's a safety information signal. And it will be given by a ship, let's say, as they're entering uh, a restricted channel where they're not going to be able to maneuver uh, except within the channel, just to let other traffic know that they are in the channel and what direction they're going and what their desk, you know, what uh, port facility they may be headed to. Uh, again, it's a safety of navigation type thing for the most part. Uh, normally, no reply here is necessary unless you need to on another another vessel or for some reason need to talk to that vessel that's making the transmission. But these are the, the international urgency signals. Again, Mayday being the most important and overrides everything. Next slide. Operator responsibility in all cases, as I said, listen, you know, take notes, you know, maybe somebody may ask you something uh, after the fact or during or be prepared to assist, but don't transmit unless you have something to offer or someone calls you. Um, but uh, you do definitely want to stay on top of a mayday or a pond signal if you hear it. Next slide, please. I think I'm going to go back and before I go into call signs, are there any questions on what we covered uh, about the urgency signals or any of the just prior information? Feel free to ask away sir. and we'll see if we can get them answered. Sir. There are no questions at this time, sir. There are no questions at this time, sir. All right, we'll, we will carry on then. Um, types of stations. We have several types of stations. I'm using Alabama Wing as, as an example. We have ground stations. Those would be your base stations. Um, Normally, these will be uh, stations that are assigned specific call signs. In this case, I'm using an example of Goldenrod 15 or Goldenrod 15. Uh, Air, Air Mobile or our aircraft would be CAP, and then nominally it would be the four digits on the tail of the aircraft. I only used a three digit example here. But those would be your aircraft call signs, be a CAP 101. Uh, and that is standard uh, throughout the organization nationwide. Mobile and portable units. Um, in our particular case, mobile units start with a number seven. 
So all of our mobile units have a seven and then a two digit call or two digits after that for their call sign. That may we can designate or we know that if we're talking to any station with a call sign beginning with a seven and it's a three digit call sign, we know that is a mobile unit. Portable units, Goldenrod 15, they're the same, uh, same tactical call signs that we have. Um, so really easy there. But you notice what's not here. You don't see things like mission base. You don't see things like ground ops, air ops, um, the IC. Those are not tactical call signs. The tactical call signs are assigned by the Air Force, by national. Those are the actual call signs assigned to the wings. The functional call signs are the ones that you would commonly use uh, on a mission or in an activity such as an encampment uh, or uh, if you or NISA or any other special activity that they're using radio communications. They will use a functional call sign for the person who is filling a particular position, such as operations or the IC or ground team one or whatever the case may be. So there's a difference. Those are those are functional call signs and are only used for that particular activity. The tactical call signs, as you see on, on the screen, those are actually assigned to the equipment and or the operator for that equipment. Next slide, please. When you're calling another station, and here you're going to see some of the pro words used. You want to establish contact, you would hear something like Goldenrod 4. This is Okay, goldenrod four over. Notice the sequence. A lot of times in public service, you'll hear it the other. Way. You'll hear the person who's doing the calling, and then who they want to get a hold of. It can be very confusing. Our standard, military standard, is who who you want to contact is who you call first. In this case. We're going to say Goldenrod 4 wants to get a hold of Goldenrod 40. So it will be Goldenrod 40. This is Goldenrod 4 over. The response should be Goldenrod 4. This is Goldenrod 40. Over. Now you've established communications. Each station knows exactly who they're talking to, and it is exactly who they want to or need to talk to. So there's no need to use the call signs from this point until the communication is ended. When the communication is ended, the station ending it will say, this is Goldenrod 4 out. That is, that's the end. They finished their traffic. All is good, so only one of them would do this. But whoever is ending the conversation, they'll give their call sign out. And that, that ends it right there. Very, very important to understand how to contact another station and do it efficiently. Next slide, please. Radio nets. As an operator, you will get involved in nets. You say, well, I don't have a base station. I'm not set up that way. I just, the only time I operate a radio is when I've got a handheld on a mission or 
or I'm operating on mission on the mission based radio or whatever. So, you know, you don't normally have one. So what do you need nets for? Well, we're going to go into that because you do. There's formal net established to, to control flow traffic. The net control station, where you'll hear the term NCS, phonetically November Charlie Sierra, maintains net discipline by controlling doing the talking. Okay, if you have to break into a net, it should only be done if you have emergency traffic. Because the block of time on that channel is set aside for that specific net. And then normally about a half hour, the next half hour may be a block of time for another wing, another group, another region for another net. So that communications can be passed on. The net control station needs to be contacted first before you can contact another station. The example would be for a check-in, Goldenrod 10, this is Goldenrod 404, no traffic, over. That would be a simple check-in, Goldenrod 404 has no message traffic to pass to anybody, but he's there within the net to receive traffic if there's any for him. Next slide, please. So we look at a directed net. In a directed net, stations obtain permission from the net control before they communicate with anyone else in the net. Okay. And a net, a directed net will often start with a roll call, or there may be a specific procedure. Uh, I have seen it both ways. Sometimes you will have the net control will actually start off with a roll call of stations that normally check in or are expected to check in. Others will have a, a net script, so to speak, where they will open the net and then they'll ask for stations from, let's say, if it's a wing net, they'll ask for stations from group one or group two or group three. So it varies, but there is a procedure for opening a net and getting the check-ins. And each station will identify itself either as called or within the within the grouping that's identified with their properly assigned tactical call sign. After the roll call or the, the all the check ins are in, then any traffic that needs to be passed uh, either from the net control to the entire net or within station stations within the net as directed by the net control station will do that. Uh, normally, the messages will be transmitted in the order of precedence. Uh, in other words, the higher precedence messages, more important ones, will go first. Next slide. A free net. Now, in this net, the net control station will still exist because that's a block of time that, that net control is responsible for, but they will authorize or allow any stations that have checked into the net to transmit traffic to other stations within the net without prior permission. Uh, and uh, a free net operation does not relieve the net control of responsibility uh, as far as maintaining circuit discipline within the net itself. They will also, they are also responsible for at the end of the allotted time period to close the net, whether it's free or directed, it matters not. Many times a directed net, if there's not a lot of traffic, they'll have a directed net and once they get all the check-ins, then they will declare it a free net until the scheduled end time for that net, and then they will formally close the net out. Next slide. So now we get down to types of nets, and I said, what do we need nets for? I don't have a base station. Well, 
There's all kinds of nets that can be established. A command net that could be within as, as small of a unit as a squadron. If you have a, a squadron with a lot of people with access to radios or have radios inside them, you could have a command net for the key people within the squadron or a group. You can have wing nets, region nets, uh, group nets, squadron nets, as I mentioned, communicators net. How about that? Uh, there could be a net slot or time slot designated strictly for communicators within a wing or a group or uh, and, and devoted to communications and improving communications. Chaplain's net, bunch of chaplains, that's possible. Special purpose nets. Now this is where you might really get involved. A mission net. At the time you're on a mission and you have radio communications established, mission base is the net control for that mission. Now, something to think about. Training nets. Any unit can establish a training net for communications training purposes. Doesn't have to be large, doesn't have to cover a lot of geography, but it can be used on a regular basis to train communicators, uh, to give new people coming in experience, to help experienced people like myself and several others I know stay in practice. Things change. Uh, communications procedures and things going on in communications are changing almost on a daily basis right now in the Civil Air Patrol. And staying up with that can be a challenge at times. So training net has its place. Are there any questions on nets? Because sometimes nets can be very confusing in how they operate and, and who works in what. So any questions in nets, please put them up now. Well, there's no questions at this time. No questions at this time. No questions, okay. All right, well, let's go on. Net station check-in and operating examples. Again, we give samples of how to check in. Your call sign with or without traffic and then over. Or you can request permission to pass traffic to another station. Uh, the proper way to do it would be get a hold of the net control this is whoever your whatever your call sign is and state what the precedence or the importance of the message may be in this case they use the example priority and who it's going to and they'll give you permission to do that you would then contact that other station and say you know are you ready to receive traffic? And they would acknowledge that by this is whatever their, their call sign is, go ahead with traffic or pass your traffic, something of that nature, and then acknowledge receipt of it after they get the message. So this is something that is, uh, can be done at roll call, it can be done anytime during the net. If something comes up and you have traffic, you can pass it. Next slide, please. Okay, one of our favorite things, and uh, uh, Zulu time, also known as, or AKA Greenwich Mean Time or Universal Coordinated Time, UTC, refers to the current time in Greenwich, England, United Kingdom. It's a system of timekeeping that refers to the same time as a reference, no matter what time zone, or no matter where you are on the planet. So 
if you are in the central time zone, as I am, you're normally six hours behind Zulu time. So in other words, if it is midnight in England, it is 1800 here. Greenwich will always lead the United States as far as time zones. If you're on the East Coast, the difference is only five hours. If you're on the Pacific Coast, the difference is eight hours. So each time zone as you move west, you increase that difference from Zulu time. Now we use Zulu time for a very important reason. And that is if you, <clears throat> it, it doesn't matter where you are uh, working on a mission or an activity, you always have a common time reference for anything that goes on in that activity. As an example, with a lot of the hurricane relief that took place a couple of years ago in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, if I'm not mistaken, is in the Atlantic time zone, which is one hour ahead of the East Coast, if I remember right. Some of the coordination for the IC staff and logistics was taking place in the central time zone and I believe Pacific time zone in the United States. So in order to coordinate all of these requirements and when people were going to talk to each other, they didn't have to worry about what time zone they were in. They were all working on the same reference time of Zulu time. So it didn't matter whether they were minus four hours or minus eight hours or minus six hours. They always had a common time to work with. Recently, uh, in Alabama, again, where I am, we are in central time zone. Georgia is in the eastern time zone. We had a mission on the state line between Georgia and Alabama. So we were working one state's in the eastern, one state's in central. Very confusing, believe it or not, with only one hour difference without using Zulu time and some of the uh, assumptions or errors that were made on scheduling in that activity uh, were very enlightening when it comes to why we use Zulu time. So all of your logs, all of the mission activities, mission logs, radio logs, everything is kept in Zulu time. It is all meaningful in one spot and it doesn't matter who's looking at it from what standpoint they all know exactly what time it happened it doesn't matter where they were located geographically go to the next slide okay you will also hear something in message handling uh, called a date time group sometimes it will be uh, abbreviated as a DTG or Delta Tango Golf. It's comprised of four elements. The first two digits, as you see in the example here, are the date. In other words, this would be the 16th month. The next four digits and time zone indicator are the time of the event or the time of the, that this is put together, again, in Zulu time. And the Z is always there, so there's no question. Whenever you write that time, you put the Z behind it. The next group is obviously the month and then the year. Well, this is a date time group, and it is utilized on messages, and it can be utilized almost anywhere else for a time reference on a document or an event. Next slide.
you will see where date time groups come into this because message traffic is where it is most commonly used. The categories of traffic, and this is written, normally written traffic, except for informal. You have formal traffic, which is going to be messages passed from one party to another party. It is a formal piece of traffic. It will be written uh, or transcribed so that there is a written record uh, and it will be passed in a formal setting. And every time it is passed by uh, a radio operator or received by a radio operator, it will be documented as coming and going. Administrative traffic, we don't see right now a whole lot of administrative traffic, but it is more, uh, it's not formal, but it would be uh, traffic that would deal with uh, ad administering uh, an activity maybe or operations not necessarily formally written on a message form but probably going to be written down notes taken on it uh, it's basically to help things work in a smooth fashion informal traffic uh, is exactly that it can be uh, down to problem solving, uh, questions on my antenna I don't think is working properly, you know, what can we do about it or how you would go about fixing that. Uh, so there's basically three categories of traffic. Formal being obviously the most important. Next slide please. Levels of precedence or importance. Flash traffic is the highest priority handled as fast as possible ahead of other messages. Flash, the flash precedence is not used in CAP messages. It is used by the military and it, you don't see it very often, but when you see it, in military traffic, it is very, very important. Immediate messages are related to situations that gravely affect the security of the nation. They require immediate delivery. Uh, again, we in CAP don't see very many immediates. Uh, it is possible, but you probably won't. Uh, you probably won't see an immediate on a, uh, even a semi-regular basis. Priorities uh, used for messages where routine is not fast enough uh, and they are processed ahead of routine. Priority is an important message, something that needs to be delivered ideally uh, within 24 to 36 hours, uh, whereas the immediate needs to be done like immediately. Uh, as rapidly as possible. Priority, you've got about 24 or so hours uh, is the goal to get it through. Most of the time, it's not a problem to get it through almost right away. Routine, this is the most often used precedence of traffic. Uh, it, it's delivered in the order received uh, as soon as possible, but uh, uh, it doesn't have the urgency of a priority message. So these levels of precedence are assigned to the message, piece of message tra traffic, and they are assigned by the originator of the message. And we'll deal with that a little bit more here in a minute. But the originator is the one that determines the importance or the level of precedence of any formal message. Next slide, please. Okay, message construction. And in, in a couple of slides, we've got a, a blank message form that we'll review uh, in, in what it looks like and where all this stuff fits in together. But there are, are several components of, of a formal message construction. Um, 
And uh, I, again, this is one of those things that, that changes rapidly, and I'll go into that again in a minute. The message will always have a number. Now, the message number is assigned by the radio operator who transmits it. In other words, message is given to him. He will assign the message number based on the numbering system that he has got where he is at in his message logs. And that will be the number assigned to that message. The precedence, we just talked about that. That will be the next thing in the message. How important, again, by the originator. The date time group, we talked about that a minute ago. The date time group is put together again. The is all on the responsibility of the person who is originating the message. So you have the precedence and you have the date and time that he wrote that message up. Who it's from, who it's going to. And then info. In other words, that's like your CC and your email. Um, there's no blind copies here. It's either to or it's carbon copy to, but that's the info line. Subject will be the subject of the message. What, what the message is going to be talking about. Um, and it can be a very short subject, but subject is the subject. Group count, that is the basically a word count. And again, when we get to the message form, the group count will make sense. But the group count is a requirement that was added not very long ago because it gives us a way to account for the completeness of the, the message. Next slide. After the group count, there will be what they call a break. It is not part of the text. It's not part of a header. It's the break between. And in transmitting the message, once you get down to the group count and you say group count and give the number, then you will say break text. Then you go into the actual information that is being sent. All right? And it's separated by that word, pro word, break. All right? It's not part of the text. At the end of the text, you will have a break. So that separates the text from both the header and the ending of the message. The end of the message will have uh, operator information, uh, when the message was transmitted, who it was transmitted to, when the message was received, who it was from, if it's forwarded on or any end notes or operator notes, that's, that'll be at the bottom of the form, which I think we're going to see in the next slide, I hope. Yep, there we go. Okay. In the upper right-hand corner, there is a notation, page one of how many pages or page blank of blank pages, all right? That would normally be filled in. Hopefully, you're only using one page and you'll understand why in a minute. The next line down is going to be the message number, incoming or outgoing. And then you have the precedence. That will be right at the top of the, of the header block. And underneath that, if you look at the form, and I hope there is a, yep, there it is, is going to be the date time group. And you notice that it's already pre-broken up in a way for you for the date, the month, or date, the time, the month, and the year. And it should have, if I'm not mistaken, a little Z in there so that you already know you got to put Zulu in there. You're working in that time. Then you have the from line and the to line, the info line and the subject line. Again, fairly self-explanatory. 
Now we come to the group count. And we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight lines of five blocks in the text portion of the message. So this message form is limited to 40 words or a group count of 40. My multiplication is right. So let's say you only have 10 words in your text. Then you would use the first and second row of blocks. That would be a group count of 10. If it was 12, you'd use the first two and then the first two in the third line, a group count of 12. That way you have a means of going back and always verifying that you got all of the groups or all of the words in that message. Ideally, you don't want a message to go over 40 words or 40 groups because it just gets too long to deal with and you have a very difficult time copying it down sometimes. So you want to keep the messages short and that makes it easier on both operators. Down at the bottom, you have the information for uh, who it was received from or who it may have been sent to and the times and the station or the operator that's sending it. And then over on the right hand side, you have a block for operator notes. And that could be literally almost anything uh, related to the message. Uh, any comments they had or if they had trouble sending it, a lot of interference. If it was on HF, they may make a note of that. Um, it, it could be anything related to the to the receipt or transmission of that message. But it's all documented on one block, one form, and that way we've got a record that the operator either transmitting and or receiving will maintain a copy of that message. Uh, for his logs, he'll be able to check it just in case. He can either maintain a copy of the message or he has to keep the message log. Uh, it depends on what his instructions are. We should note this form was changed as recently as April of 16, it's four years ago. Uh, this is when the group counts were actually established in. Uh, and of formal operating procedures. In previous additions to this, the CAP 4105 cannot be used, and there are previous editions out there that are not in the format that you see in front of you on this sample. So if you run across something that is prior to April of 16, those CAP 4105s are no longer to be used. Now we're going to go to another form some of you may or not have seen and that is the communications log or the cap form 110. The latest form is dated September of 14 and previous editions may be used. There's been no radical changes in this form and it's really very common. It's used to keep track of the communications for a particular station. Uh, again, in the upper right hand corner, you have page blank of blank pages. This form can go multiple pages. Uh, at the top of the form, you're going to have uh, blocks for uh, call sign, for mission number, if there's a mission related to what's going on, um, maybe uh, you'll have a location. Then down in the next row, you'll have, let's see, one, one, two, there's six blocks there, uh, starting with the letter A, B, C, 
D, E, and F. And those will go through. And what you will be doing in there, they're designed to put in the channel that you're operating on. You can put, uh, for example, um, you could put a repeater that you're working on uh, in A, let's say R26, and you could put CC1 in B, and you might have uh, uh, SEC, Sierra Echo Charlie in C, that would be your HF communications. So this is a log for a station, such as let's say Goldenrod 1.5. And Goldenrod 1.5 is now saying he can operate on those three particular channels, R26, Charlie Charlie 1, and uh, Sierra Echo Charlie, and all of the information can be logged on this sheet. Um, and it's again in Zulu time, uh, that goes in the first column. The second column is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the station called. And then the third column is the, is the channel. So you would put A, B, or C in that column. And then out to the side, you would have what the call was about. Um, checked into the net. Um, passed message number such and such. Um, but the log is designed so that it can be used by one station on multiple channels. That way, you don't have to keep a separate log for HF, a separate log for VHF. It's very, very time consuming. And this makes it much easier. These logs should be retained by the station uh, or the activity in the case of, of let's say an encampment or uh, NISA. Logs like this would be maintained for a minimum of one year because they are a formal record of what went on. Any questions to this point on anything we've covered? Fair uh, yes, sir. There is a question related to originator's message. A uh, question from Lieutenant Tanner, Texas. Does the originator's message number stay with the message along its entire route of transmission? or does each operator in the chain use their own message number? Colonel, can you check your mute button, please? Uh, 
it, but it was on. OK. So did we get the question answered? I'm sorry, now, sir, but I think you were muted during your answer. Oh, no. OK. Um, well, well, we'll review it then again. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, the originator of the message, the person who's writing it, will assign the precedence and the date time group. The initial operator or MRO who transmits that message will be the one to assign the message number to it. That way, that message can be tracked regardless of where it is sent and that unique identifier will be on it and can be traced back to that operator. Uh, the originator obviously is identified in the message. And if there's any question as far as where the message came from initially or where it was transmitted from, that will be uh, uniquely identified by the operator who first transmitted it. And that message number will remain with the message uh, again, regardless of where it goes. Any more questions? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. Okay. okay, no problem. See, now I had this problem just a second ago. Nobody hears me. Okay. Uh, choose a good communication site. That's the first thing you want to do to avoid the prior statement. Nobody hears me. OK, high ground, the higher the antenna, the better, obviously. Uh, no, don't climb on top of the van to get your handheld radio to give you greater range. That's not a safe thing to do. Um, but you want to get as high as possible. High ground, VHF, always remember VHF, think simplex, always line of sight. OK, now. Let's let's drop back to our repeater discussion earlier. VHF is line of sight. If the repeater antenna can quote unquote see your handheld antenna, then you're going to communicate. If it doesn't, you won't. Simplex, VHF is line of sight. So you're Always remember that, and that will help you in determining what's going to be the best position for you to be in. How high a ground? Where are you at? It, you may find yourself uh, literally searching for a hill, but it can make all the difference. Stay away from interference generators, power lines, power transformers. Underground cables, if you know where they're buried or they're marked, like telephone lines and that sort of thing, they can interfere with communications. Other radios can interfere with communications. Computers, believe it or not, can inf interfere with two-way communications. There's lots of things there that, that can go on. Um, but the main thing is you want your antenna or your location to be as high as possible, especially when you're in the field. Next. OK, so you have a problem. Nobody hears me still. Common problems and solutions. Yes, indeed. The first one, operator failure. The most common cause. Indeed, make sure you're following normal procedures. Make sure you are using common sense. Make sure you're thinking. Uh, you've got the proper information from any briefings you may have received. But check the radio. Make sure it's turned on, on the correct channel. <laughs> and is the volume turned up? Uh, we, have, we have radios in use that you can uh, stick them in a cargo pocket or you can do just about, you know, whatever. It just seems that the volume controls have this talent 
for going from maximum to minimum with no assistance from the operator, and then they wonder why they can't operate. It happens. Have you got a good battery? You know, carry a spare, get a charged battery, or set it about if it's something that takes replaceable batteries, carry a spare set. Again, back to the repeater, you know, if if you can use a repeater and it's you and you've got authorization for it or that's in the plan, use it. Again, you may have to look for that high ground though. You never know. If you got aircraft up, maybe you can get a relay from an aircraft. Move to higher ground is a repeat. Unfortunately, if all else fails and you got a cell phone, if you have service available, use it. It is done. But the common problems for radio are really check the radio. Most of the time, that's where the problem is. If it's a mobile unit, make sure you've got the antenna connected. Make sure you don't have any cables pinched. Common sense. All those components you have to have together to get that system or that radio to work. Double check everything. Make sure you've got it all together the way it's supposed to be. Next slide. Transmitter power. More is better, right? No, not really. We should be using the minimum power necessary to maintain satisfactory operations. That means the minimum power to be able to communicate. All right. We should also only be using the minimum power required to establish communications. Maybe you can establish communications on higher power on VHF and then go to low power depending upon where you're located in relation to the other station. Use the minimum. HF especially. HF is long range. And, you know, yeah, we're allowed a lot of power on HF. Do we need it all? Not necessarily. So you want to use the minimum because that helps reduce interference with other stations, especially if they're close by. So we always want to be thinking about that. Also, in the case of battery power if you use the low power instead of high power especially on a handheld you're going to it greatly extend the time that you can communicate before you have to replace that battery with a fresh one next please communications plans we always have communications plans national publishes one every year. Every region and wing are required to publish one every year in support of the national plan. In reality, groups and squadrons should have some type of communications plan based on what their activities and their, uh, their tasking or their uh, level of interest may be. Uh, a unit that is very heavily oriented in communications may have a more detailed plan than uh, a squadron two cities over, but you need to have a plan for what you're going to do for training, for day-to-day -day operations, uh, very important. Uh, an emergency plan, how are you going to support a search and rescue mission? How do you fit into the to the wing plan to do that. Uh, all of that is, is explained and a lot of the changes that are coming about in CAP communications you find within these plans. Now, the question is where can you find them? Well, they're, they should be available from the squadron communications officer. Uh, you can get them from wing, but there is a much easier source and if you can log into eServices, you can tap into this source. It's called the Communications Library. And it has 
answers to a multitude of questions and communications all the way down the line. If you go into eServices and the main page opens up, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, on the bottom right hand side in the blue section that is on the bottom, you'll see Civil Air Patrol sites and you'll see eServices, Wimmers and oh my, communications. How about that? If you click on that link, it will open up the page that you see right adjacent in the PowerPoint. And let's see if I can get this naturally not. Give me just one second. OK. Uh, hopefully you can see that a little bit better than I can on the PowerPoint, but I'll look at it on a big screen. And you'll notice there's communications main menu, which is where you're at when this page opens up. And you have links for repair service and accessories request. If you have a radio assigned to you and it's not working right, and you've done everything you can do, you can request service. You have a repeater directory. Now this repeater directory is not just for your wing. You can look up any repeater in the country in that repeater directory by wing. Um, so the information is there. Uh, for aviation, you have altitude restrictions listed in the link there. If you go to the right on the top half, you have the communications library. This is a whole list of publications and downloads and training material that you can access uh, right here on the site. Uh, communications staff directory uh, lists the national communications staff. Uh, down below on the left, you have equipment compliance for HF and VHF. There's some amateur radio operators out there that may have a radio they want to know if they can use it for CAP. It'll be in that list. Uh, regulations and manuals relating to CAP. Different tests uh, that are located uh, in LMS or actually in Axios now. Uh, and then the right, you have NTIA, NTIA Red Book, which is the governing rules uh, for us from the NTIA, FCC rules and regulations. There is a wealth of information on this page, and anyone interested in communications can access things simply by going into eServices, going down to the bottom, and clicking the link. If you have any questions about this, let me know. I'll be glad to help you out. Uh, it doesn't matter what wing you're in. Matters not to me. Uh, you can go on to the next page. But this is a good resource to use. Getting toward the end, I want to talk about something real important. Prohibited operating practices. Everyone knows probably from movies and this sort of thing what radio silence is. Don't violate it if it's ever imposed. I have never seen it imposed in CAP communications and I've been involved with communications for a long time. Don't violate it if it's imposed. Personal conversations. Uh, no, you cannot order a pizza by way of CAP radio. That is just not to be done. No, I'm going to pick up the milk or I got to run this errand. Nope, that's personal conversation. Not allowed to do it. As we discussed before, you don't want to transmit into a net without getting permission from the net control. And just exactly like that, you don't want to transmit without identifying yourself by call sign uh, there are ways sometimes if it persists, we can find out who you are. Uh, but you don't want to do that. 
it's it's just poor poor operating practices excessive tuning and testing uh, i don't know so much about the tuning but the testing uh, it does happen sometimes you got to test you got to see if you can access that repeater or you got to see if you can uh, if you you've got a, a good uh, antenna match to your radio don't do it to excess don't use amateur radio or citizens band frequencies or channels for CAP business or the other way around. Amateur is amateur, CB is CB, CAP is CAP. If you're conducting CAP business and you happen to be an amateur radio operator, and there are many of us, remember if it's CAP business that you're conducting, do it on CAP radios. If you're an amateur and it's not CAP business, keep it on the amateur radios. So it's very, very important to keep that separation. Remember, amateur and citizens band are governed by the Federal Communications Commission. We are governed by the NTIA. Totally set different set of rules in many cases. And along with that, you don't use 10 signals or 10 code like 10-4, and you don't use amateur Q signals like QRM or QRZ, anything like that. So remember, don't get into the bad habit of doing things that are prohibited on this list. Next slide. And we come to, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Peter. 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 Do CAP radio operators have to purchase their NTIA compliance or will it be issued? Will it be issued? Okay, who is that from? It's uh, Lieutenant Tanner in Texas, sir. Okay, that will, uh, the issuance of radios will be up obviously to the wing and it depends on several, uh, several things. Uh, one of course is the table of allowances and there are, there is new equipment coming online and it, it is being, uh, as it's received, being sent to the wings from national on a, uh, uh, a basis of uh, priority. I know some of ours uh, have been prioritized. Some of the new VHF units have been prioritized to new vehicles because we're trying to get that goal accomplished within our wing. Uh, as far as issuing a radio or getting a radio uh, to a member, the first point of contact probably is going to be the communications officer for the unit. Um, and if that uh, doesn't work out, the communications officer for the uh, group or the wing would be the next stop. Uh, one of the priorities that is being done, I do know, is uh, uh, for ground teams, uh, besides the equipping all the mobiles, all the vans with uh, uh, VHF, there are ground team kits going out of the new handhelds uh, and they're going out as a block and they're going out to units that have ground teams already. That much I do know. Uh, there's still a lot of equipment to come in. Uh, there's a possibility of surplus EF Johnson's being available for assignment to members because as they are replaced with the new Motorola's, there will be, uh, they will be downgraded to a, a I want to say a, a lower priority. They're no longer considered mission critical. And so those will become available uh, for assignment within the wing or however, however Texas wing is doing it. Again, I can't speak for them, 
I know what we're trying to do in Alabama. Uh, and I do know that some of the excess Johnsons as they become available are going to be available to the units uh, or for assignment out to squadron members uh, who want to pursue communications. That's probably without uh, uh, speaking with him one-on-one, uh, -on -one, which I would be more than happy to do. Uh, uh, that's probably the best answer I can give to this forum. Uh, that will depend on, on the wing and the, and the table of allowances for the equipment and how they're setting up the distro within each, within each region and wing. Uh, but if he would like to contact me, my contact information is up there. I, by all means, anyone who's anyone who's listening, who's on, feel free to contact me with any question you've got. I will do my absolute best to answer it. If I can't answer it, I promise you I will find the answer uh, because that's just the way we need to do business. Anything else? Uh, yes, sir. Can e can the EF Johnsons be used for squadron training what? for non-mission work? Mission work. Uh, you you broke up. Can you say that again? Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Can EF can Johnsons EF? be used for squadron training for non-mission work? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons that the Johnsons, uh, as they become, uh, as they become uh, non-mission critical, so to speak, that's one of the reasons that one of the primary uses they're going to be doing. Uh, in fact, we have plans for that for some that become available uh, to us, hopefully within the next couple of months. Uh, we have some cadets that are very interested in communications in my unit, and our intention is to. Uh, get them to a point where we uh, can actually have the radio issued out to them uh, and let them utilize it and basically start from our own within our own unit for a training training net and then work up from there get them to where they can check into the wing net that goes on a couple of times a week and that sort of thing so the answer to that is yes any of the radios, any of the radios can be utilized for training purposes. If we don't use them to train people, we're actually not helping our own cause. Anything else? Uh, no, sir, no further questions. Okay. Well, again, uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, the questions and I appreciate the, the folks that have taken the time to listen to this and I would, would say again uh, anyone who has any questions or wants to discuss anything communications wise my contact information is on the screen feel free to contact me at any point by email and I will get back with you and I hope you all have a very good evening Yeah, okay, we're back. <laughs>